Morning, everybody. Good to see you. Um, for those of you who listened to Jeff, who said the service would be an hour, um, I think he's wrong. Uh, we're going to be taking a little bit more time. But uh, I do just want to say welcome to all of you who are watching online. It's wonderful that you have this opportunity. Candice in Cape Town, the Shipley's over in Ireland, folk in Norway, folk in the States. Uh, just great to have you sharing in our service today. Phil Croppers, you're amazing that you can do this technologically with Crystal and your team. So, Thank you, my man. You've done an awesome job. And for such a time as this, you have proven to be the man of the hour. And so we want you to know how much we appreciate you. Um, there were some other things that I was going to talk about, but for the sake of time, probably we'll have to leave those till next week. We have a group of folk who are coming into membership. We were going to announce their names, uh, but I'm with their permission. Hopefully we'll just leave that until possibly next week. We do just, however, want to say to you that uh, with regard to the situation where we're at in the church and our services at the moment, we will be taking it one day at a time. And, I, I, you know, things have changed even in the course of the last week. Every day things have changed and new, new legislation has come on and new things have been decided. So it's very, very difficult to decide today what's going to happen next week. So just keep up to date with us in our, on the technological side. Be in touch with us. And uh, I hope that you'll get the message sooner or later as to what next week will look like. I want to take you today to a, a great passage of, of Scripture. I want to talk to you about Psalm 26. Psalm 26, and I'm going to read it to you in a moment. But I think it's the context of this psalm that gives it the most meaning. This psalm, they tell us, was written at David's darkest hour. You thought the day, darkest hour of David was maybe after his mess up with Bathsheba or after his issue with the army and naming. But there is nothing more tragic than rebellion within your own family. And David, in the darkness of Absalom's rebellion, wrote Psalm 26. This is probably one of his darkest, if not the darkest hour of this most amazing man. Listen what he has to say. It says this. Vindicate me, O Lord, for I have led a blameless life. I have trusted in the Lord without wavering. Test me, O Lord, and try me. Examine my heart and my mind, for your love is ever before me, and I will walk continually in your truths. I do not sit with deceitful men, nor do I consort with hypocrites. I abhor the assembly of evildoers and refuse to sit with the wicked. I wash my hands in innocence and go about your altar, O Lord, proclaiming aloud your praise and telling of all your wonderful deeds. I love the house where you live, O Lord, the place where your glory dwells. And then verse 12, he says this, My feet, my feet stand on level ground, and in the great assembly I will praise the Lord. He found people, an amazing place that in his terminology he calls the level ground. That no matter despite the storms that he's going through, no matter the rebellion from his own son, no matter the brokenness of his own heart and the tormenting of his own will, he finds this level ground. And I hope that everybody who's listening today at the end of this We'll be able to know what level ground looks like, know where level ground is found, and know how to stand upon it when you find it. So I hope that we will find this today. But I need to begin at the end by talking about what that level ground looks like. He found an even place. One terminology says, I have found this level ground or an even place. Let me tell you what this even place, first of all, is, is not. First of all, I want you to understand that the even place is not necessarily, number one, a happy place. I don't think he was particularly happy at the time of his finding the need for the even place. It was not a happy place. It was a sad place. It was a broke place of brokenness. And I'm not sure where we get this idea in our church philosophy or theology where we think that Christians have to live in a happy place. I don't think we need to find a happy place. I think we need to find this even place that he speaks of here. 
And I would suggest that maybe as theologians, those that are amongst you, we need to find a better theology on suffering. Because suffering, as I see it, is very much part of what the Christian experience is all about. Anybody who was ever anybody in Scripture understood what it meant to suffer. Not all the time, but certainly some of the time, suffering was very much a part of the organization of what God would suggest being a follower of Jesus would look like. And it's, it's kind of like we, we become Christians and we think there's going to be no bumps in the road. We think there'll be no obstacles. Of course there will be. And have a look at any of the Christian saints. You will see that Paul faced with incredible obstacles. Paul faced with incredible bumps in the road. And Jesus himself tells us this one. He clinches it with incredible terminology. He says, if you want to follow me, what does he say? Take up your, your cross. And follow me. A cross is a, an item of suffering. He's saying if you want to take up your cross also, you're going, to, you're going to suffer as I am suffering and will suffer, so too will you. And the picture of that cross is a picture of that which we will not necessarily have a happy place. Secondly, this place is not a place that is necessarily a prosperous place. Here we go in the face of some some kind of theologians out there who suggest that we can kind of live in this prosperous state continually. I love the idea of God blessing generosity, and God indeed does that. But uh, I think that this place is, is very specifically for us not necessarily a prosperous place. When you look at how different people look at the issue of prosperity or comfort or, 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 or anything that, that makes me nice and, and comfortable, the, we, we seem to have polarized views of this. It's not abnormal to find people with different views of what this looks like. If you want an example, just have a look at maybe Moses. When Moses was in the wilderness, Moses was quite content with just having God. Against two or three million other people who were continually grumbling and discontent in the nature of the experience of what it meant to be in the wilderness. They were continually grumbling. They were continually... And yet when you look at Moses, here's Moses in a state of complete contentment. And he's happy. And Moses has found the secret to contentment. He's found a secret. The other two million or whatever million people who were, they didn't find the same secret that Moses found. And Moses found this secret that when, when you're up against everything and you, you kind of understand that if you have nothing, you will know that if you have nothing but God, you will still have enough. Nothing but God, and you will still have enough. That's a secret maybe we need to understand and learn that this nice and prosperous place is also not just a, a misunderstanding, but it's also an elusive place. Because in the world in which we live, everybody wants kind of more, you know, and more is more, and, and enough is never enough. And we have this weird idea of why we live the way we do looking for more than e enough. And I just think sometimes of, or maybe an example of this would be how we play Monopoly. And you play Monopoly, and I play with my kids and every now and then, and Elena, I'll sit and play with Monopoly with these guys, and I never win, but I'll tell you why in a moment. But uh, Monopoly is kind of like our life. It's kind of like our life where we want the best properties. And I'm going to build some house on these properties, and I'm going to nail you. You land my place, I'm going to take your money. And then we want to take a house, and we want to build bigger houses, more houses. And then we want to have hotels on our property. And we want to grow, and we want to take the money from people around us. And we laugh, but that's kind of how we live our lives. And at the end of the time, we find that life is just like a game of Monopoly, because when it's all over, everything goes back in the box, and we play the game again. Or when we die, somebody else plays the game. I never win at Monopoly, and I found out, I think, why. You see, when I play Monopoly, I have a little pile of money over here, which is my tithe money. And I tithe all the money that people pay to me, and I put it in a little pile. So when somebody else can't pay their bills, I pay their bills for them. I'm such a nice guy. And I can't understand why I never win Monopoly, because I don't understand what it is to chase the money. And I, I continually lose all, all the time. So as believers today, people, this even place is not necessarily a prosperous place. Thirdly, this even place is not necessarily an exciting place. 
Everybody wants excitement. They will chase the exciting places around, and they hope that they can find something that is exciting. I don't find people in the Scriptures finding this to be entirely true. I'm not taking away that there were exciting things that were happening. But I was reading just this morning as I was cons- confirming my thoughts on, on Elijah. Now, this was a man of a, he was an adrenaline junkie. He was a great prophet. And when he first came into taking on the role of the prophet, we can sense his incredible excitement. And so I'm now the prophet of God, and I'm going to do these things, and I'm going to be a voice for God. I have no fear, and I'm going to go out there, and I'm going to do my stuff as a prophet. But the first thing that God had to show him, we read in 1 Kings chapter 17, was God took this very excited man, and he put him in a brook, a little stream down there, and he said, Elijah, you need to spend some time here. Elijah thought that the time might be just a week. You know, he could put up with a week, maybe a month or two. After a year, he was beginning to wonder, what is God trying to do with me here? God supernaturally fed him. The ravens brought him food. But God said, you will sit here because your experience of following me is not always exciting. And I need to tell you that up front. Three and some year, Elijah sat at the brook. He sat there. God fed him every day. And he was saying, God, this is going to be more than this. I've got to get out there and do stuff. And then after that three and a half years, after the widow of Zarephath, he went out and he did the most exciting thing. We called fire down from heaven. He killed the 450 prophets of Baal. And the excitement was about to begin. But people, listen. Our Christian experience is not always an exciting one. Generally, most of our Christian life is just going to be plotting. There will be exciting times. I am totally sure of that. But most of the time we will spend is just in the routine of what it means to love God, serve people, and continue reading the Scriptures and growing in our relationship with Him. So this even place is not necessarily a happy place, a prosperous place, or an exciting place. Let's talk a little bit more about what this even place looks like. Let's go back this way. An even place is kind of like locating it. I will take you back to a reference we used a little while back where we used a, a picture of an, of an iceberg. I don't know if you guys remember that. And we noted that an iceberg has 20% of it is above the waterline. And I said to you that your life or you are just like that iceberg, where there is 20% of you that we can see. There's 20% that you could possibly fool us with. It's the 20% of who we see from people around you. But it's only 80%. You know where this even place is found? It's found below the waterline. Below the waterline. This is the place where your character lives. This is the place where your heart condition is in a spiritual way. This is a place where your will exists. And you read in the passage here where he says, Lord, check me out. Check me out and examine me at the point of that which is going on below the waterline of my life because, Lord, that is the even place. We could fool one another with the top 20%. You know that. We can make you believe that we are what we look like. And sometimes that is true. Sometimes it may not be. But below the waterline of our lives is where we find the even place. This is a place where, according to the passage, your heart lives. This is where the will of your mind exists. And the even place is right there. Now, there is a place in the middle of the ocean somewhere, I'm not sure where, where there is such depth in the ocean, so far below the waterline, that nothing has moved for hundreds of years. It's a place of complete stillness. It's a place where the even place stays and nothing disturbs it. Wouldn't it be amazing, people? Wouldn't it be incredible if we could find that even place in our lives? We, no matter what happened around us, we remained un disturbed. Well, David, in his condition here, and he's so disturbed in his mind and in his thinking, but in his heart, he has found the even place that no matter what is going on on the surface, the storms are raging on the surface, and yet the even place in the stillness and the depth of his soul, which is below the waterline, is unmoved. He has found the even place. 
And when we find in our own lives the place where there's evenness, the place where there is, is nothing that is, can disturb us, we find where David found right now. Now, there is potential to disturb what goes on below the waterline. And in this passage in verse 2, we find three things that can disturb the even place. Let me tell you what they are. The first one is, in verse 2, you can check it out, is the past. If you have not dealt with issues of the past, those things can bounce back on you and they can disturb the evenness of your even place. They can do that. And if you have a look in the passage here, those three things that talk about those disturbing things out there, the first one of the past is, is the things where he said, he says this so beautifully, he says, Lord, I, I am blameless in your eyes. He's not saying he's perfect. He's just saying he's blameless, which means that he's not carrying guilt around. He's not carrying the shame of his previous life around with him. There is a great theological word that the past needs to understand, and it's simply the word justified. For people who can walk knowing that they are justified with God, there will be no disturbance in the even place because of the past. It's about being justified. It's about knowing that you have been forgiven and living in the context of forgiveness. I think sometimes we almost tend to make God a liar where God says, I have forgiven you, and you're saying, Lord, that is really nice, but I'm going to live an unforgiven lifestyle. I'm going to carry the guilt and the shame around me, and around with me, and, and we almost make God a liar. God is not a liar, people. When God says He has forgiven you, you know what? He has forgiven you. God will not lie about this. He's not going to say, I've forgiven you and punish you for that. No, not at all. But when we live under thinking that my past will determine who I am in the present, we have missed the boat completely. There's a great book that was written by Colson, and he was the one who took the fall at uh, the Watergate scandal and was spent some time in jail. But when he finished there, he had created an incredible ministry amongst prison people in America and even around the world. And uh, he reports in his book called The Body, which is a great book that you should read, how he went and he visited certain prisons. And he found a, a prison place that was run by the prisoners itself. There were no prison guards. The prisoners ran their own prison. And they had rules, they had regulations, and they had requirements. But the prisoners took responsibility for the prison. So he goes and he finds this prison and he, he, he takes a tour of the prison. And this is what he says he found in the middle of this prison where the prisoners guarded the prison. The prisoners made sure that everything went well. He says this, When I visited Humatia, I found the inmates smiling, particularly the murderer who held the keys of the prison. The murderer opened the gate and let me in. Wherever I walked, I saw men at peace. I saw clean living areas, people working industriously. The walls were decorated with biblical sayings, with psalms and proverbs. My guide escorted me to the notorious prison cell once used for torture. Today he told me that blockhouse, only a single inmate was in there. As we reached the end of the long concrete corridor and he put the key in the lock, he paused and he asked, Are you sure you want to go in? Of course, I replied impatiently. I've been in isolation cell all over the world. Slowly he swung open the massive door and I saw the prisoner in that punishment cell. A crucifix, beautifully carved by the Humatia inmates. The prisoner Jesus was hanging on the cross. He's doing time for us. My guide said softly. You get the picture, people? That's a powerful picture. And when we learn to live this life in the present, in the knowledge that we are justified, it's the foundation for the even place. I hope that you have found that justification because the even place is going to be determined by your dealing with the issues of the past. You are justified you are forgiven if you have come to Him in repentance. 
The second aspect that we find in verse 2 is that of the present. There are things that are going on in the present time that can disturb your even place. And when you look at this, you have to look and say, well, what is he saying in the Scripture? Yeah, he says this. He said, Lord, prove me. He says, try me. This is the aspect of the present. He said, Lord, check out how I am living. Am I pleasing to you? Are the things that I'm doing, Lord, prove me and try me and try me now. And you say, well, what, what, are, what are the evidences of somebody who has found the even place when we tell God or ask God to prove us or to try us? It's found in very simply the proof. You say there are people there who will say one thing and live another. And that is always really sad. There is an element, I guess, of hypocrisy in all of us, but it doesn't excuse it. But what are we doing in that even place right now? He says there's two proofs of whether you're living in the even place in the present, and they come by way of fruit, of fruit. The first aspect is that of the fruit of the Spirit, and the second aspect is that of the fruit of faith. If you want to know if you found the even place now, in the present time, have a look at those two aspects of fruit. The fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, meekness, and self-control. Are those evident in your life? Can you point to those or can people point to those as proof that you are and have found the even place in this? Matthew 21, Jesus curses a fig tree because the fig tree was a hypocrite. He looked across and he said to his disciples, we're all hungry, there's a fig tree over there, let's go get some fruit off the fig tree. So he takes his disciples and they walk across to the fig tree. It's a leaf, it looked like it should have fruit. But when they got there, they found that the tree had no fruit, although it had the leaves. And Jesus cursed that tree because the tree was hypocritical in its thing. It was looking like it showed potential, it was looking like it would have fruit. But when you get close, you find, hey ho, there's nothing there. And Jesus found and he cursed the hypocritical tree and it died. So you will know in the present if you are living the even place lifestyle when there is fruit in your life. You need to check that out. The second aspect of it is, is that there will be faith in your life. There will be faith that is evident out there, the fruit of, of, of faith. Now, just read your Bible open probably on any page. Look at any particular character, and you will notice that faith is the only thing that pleases God. Hebrews tells us that. Without faith, you cannot be pleasing to God. So have a look at these amazing stories out there of people of faith, and God applauds them and says, against the odds, against the prevailing wisdom, you have trusted me in all these things. So many examples of this. I love the story of Noah. Here's Noah told by God to make a boat, gives them the dimensions, tells them what it's going to be used about, used for. And he tells them, Noah, you may not understand this, but there's going to come a day when there will be rain and we will need this boat. Noah had never seen rain before. And yet his faith in God was so real. He says, Lord, if, if that is what you want me to, to do, then, then I will do it. 120 years later, 120 years of getting up every day, building this boat, 120 years of mockery from the people, and yet at the end of the day, he had his boat, and he had won the smile and the approval of God because of his fruit of faith. You want to please God, people? We all know how we need to do it, this fruit of faith. I just think if there are any kids watching out there on the live streaming, there's a great story of that, about something like this. There was a man, and many of you will know this story, and he was a tightrope walker, and uh, he was spectacular in what he could do on the tightrope. And so one day in an act of incredible boldness, he put a tightrope apparently across the Niagara Falls, and everybody said, why are you doing that? He says, no, I'm going to walk this tightrope. And they said, we don't think that's a very good idea. We think you're going to fall off. He said, watch me. And he walked across on the tightrope. And when he got to the other side, everybody applauded him, but nobody wanted to do what he had done. And he walked back again. 
And he walked backwards and forwards multiple times doing different things. He walked backwards. He walked forward. He turned around on, on the, on the tightrope. He did incredible things. And the, current, the people just applauded him. But nobody went out there and pl- applied what they had learned. So he came to a young man, apparently, and he said, Young man, I'm going to push this wheelbarrow across. Do you think I can push it across? And the young man said, Yeah, man, I think you can, eh? So he pushed the wheelbarrow over, and everybody applauded again. He pushed it back, and he said to that young man, do you think I could do it again? And the young man said, oh, absolutely, I think you could do it again. He says to the young man, well, will you get in the wheelbarrow and come with me, and I'll push it over with you? And Oh, no, 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 no. You see, I believe that, but not, not for me. You see, I'm happy to applaud it, but I don't want to apply it. And so many of us in our own lives, we applaud acts of faith. I applaud Noah, I applaud Abraham who laid his child on the altar and was about to sacrifice him. And and I I applaud those things, but am I going to apply those things in my own life? You see, when you find the even place in that place where it now is the present, it will be measured by the proof of the fruit of the Spirit and the fruit of, of faith. There's one more. In the passage, verse 2, he talks about the future being able to affect the, the present. And uh, he talks about the, the, the future, the, the, the nervousness we feel for the future, being out there and being able to say, well, I, you know, I'm so nervous for the future, I don't quite know what I'm going to do. So in verse 2, he says, God, test me. Test me. Yeah, he says, Lord, examine me. In verse 2, Lord, examine me, and I will show you, Lord, that my past has gone. I am blameless in your eyes. I am blameless. Test me with regard to the past. In the present, he's talking about proving who he is in the context of his even place. He says, Lord, prove me and look at my fruit, look at my faith, and you will see that I can tick that box. And then lastly, he says, Lord, with regard to the future, I'm going to invite you to test me. Now he's broken. His son has gone in rebellion against him. He's a broken man. He says, Lord, but I will pass this test. You see, he acknowledges it's just a test. When we go to school, what do we do? The teacher's not being mean when he gives us a test, I hope. The test is just proof that you have a applied the knowledge that you have and are able and the objective of the test is that you should pass i need to tell you people this coronavirus is just a test just a test i hope we pass the test i hope we pass the test as we look into the future do not let the future shake up the disturbance and disturb your even place god has always tested people has he not we mentioned Abraham, when Abraham took Isaac, laid him on the altar, and was about to plunge that knife into his son, and the angel stopped him, and the angel would have said, Abraham, you've passed the test. It was just a test. And Abraham, you have won the smile of God because you've passed the test. We're going to go through some testing, are we not? We're going to be starting, and we're going to be going through some tough times, I'm sure, But the test that I think is probably the toughest, as verse 2 would suggest, is the test of purification. It's the holiness test. Now, there are many tests that God has. He has the test of stewardship. He has the test of of time. He has all these different tests that we have to pass. But the test of purity is the test that he's talking about here. He says, Lord, examine my heart and my mind. That's where most of the stuff is happening, below the waterline over here. He says, test me. Check me out to say that I am, to see that I am what I say I am. But this test of holiness, guys, it's a tough test because the test of holiness involves heat. Nobody likes to get too close to the flame. We like the heat to keep us warm, but we don't want to get too close to the flame because it's uncomfortable. And for some people, the Christian faith is too hot for them, so they get out the kitchen As believers, we need to fly closer to the flame. We need to ask God, test me. Check me out. Check my heart, Lord. I want to fly closer to the flame of your holiness 
God wants you to burn off all the rubbish out there. Burn off all the bad attitudes I have. Burn off all the horrible habits that I have developed. God, burn them off because I want to walk in holiness and I want to fly closer to the flame of your holiness. And when you're at that place and the journey is hot and you stay in the kitchen and you say, God, turn up the heat, make me more like you. Jesus, burn away anything that doesn't look like you. God says, you found the even place. You found it. So as I wind this thing up today, folks, just a quick little recap over here. We said just now where the even place is not. The even place is not necessarily a happy place. Place. The even place is not necessarily a prosperous place. This even place that David found is not necessarily an exciting place. The even place is a place that lives below the waterline of who you are. It's a place where, where your character lives. It's a place where, God's, where your heart is revealed, where the will of your mind is being tested. That's where the even place lives. Things that can disturb the even place are things of the past. People, do you know that you're justified? If you're not, you need to ask God to do that for you because that's the foundation of what it means to be in the even place. Your sin's forgiven, a right relationship with Him, and then believe Him that you are forgiven. That's the key. And then secondly, it can so easily be disturbed by the things that are going on in the present. And we say, what is happening in the present is the fruit of my life indicating that I'm a follower of Jesus? Or am I like the fig tree where I appear to be something but in fact am not? We need to check that out. We need to check out how our issues of faith are as it results to the result points to the present. Are we living by faith? During this coronavirus time, it's a great test. It's a test of your faith. I hope you pass that test. And then as the future, we know too, that the future will determine so much about who we are in the present, but it's going to be hot down here as you fly closer to the flame of God's holiness and allow Him to burn all that rubbish away. I'm going to pray in a moment, but I do need to ask you, have you found your even place? Have you found it? Because I really hope and pray that you do. We pray. Father, today, today we want to thank you just for this incredible man, David. That amidst the ups and downs and the turmoil of his life and the brokenness of his heart at the point of the son's rebellion against his own father, and yet he still stood in that even, level, safe place. And even though for him it was not a happy place, it probably was a threat to his economic place, it was not always an eventful place, but it was where he was. He was not, David was not, not shaken or disturbed in that even place by his past. Even though he had messed up so many times, he knew that you had forgiven him and he lived like that. He knew that you had justified him. And as we look at his life, even as he lived in the present then, we saw fruit, love, joy, peace. He still loved Absalom. There was still fruit of the Spirit in his life. There was faith in his life and faith in you that you were able to overcome every aspect of the challenges he was facing. And then, Lord, he cried out to you for the future to put him to the test, to examine his heart, to examine his mind, and if there be any rubbish there, to burn it off. It's a courageous prayer. And I pray that we would be courageous enough to pray that today. Again, Lord, we commit to you the issues of our nation. Lord, I think it was Gary that said that this is possibly the church's finest hour. If we as the church could find our even level place man the world will come running to find out why we can survive this without all the anger and the confusion 
and the fear that there is out there. Lord, I pray that we as individuals find our even place and that the church in South Africa would find it too. Go with us now, Lord, we pray. Watch over every member of our church and churches around us. Bless them in that which is happening at this time as well. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.